In today's video, I'm going to be teaching you what a high fat diet is going to do to your gut and your microbiota. And then towards the end of the video, we're going to talk a little bit about nutrition as a whole, my personal opinion on the matter, and what you might want to do if you are currently on a high fat diet. Does it make sense for you to continue it or might you want to take a different change of direction? Stay tuned if you want to learn more. Per our usual here on this channel, we're going to start by talking about the science and the mechanisms and the research. And then from that, we can make an informed decision and we can have a more useful conversation about what you should actually do. So science first, then we're going to noodle on it. Carb pun intended, by the way. So here's your human digestive system. I know it looks weird like this, but this is basically what it is. You are a hollow tube from mouth to anus and there are different digestive secretions and microbes and enzymes that are going to be living in all of these different regions. And obviously when you eat fat, the first thing that you can start think of, thinking of is the digestive process for that fat. So you're going to be secreting bile from your gallbladder or your liver if you don't have a gallbladder, and you're going to be secreting lipases and enzymes from your pancreas. And those things are going to help break down and emulsify the fat so that it's easier to cross from the inside of the GI tube across the gut barrier and into your bloodstream to ultimately be nutrition and nourishment for you, the human being. Now, there is probably a conversation to be had for high fat diets promoting more bioflow, potentially excessively. I will say here and now that I have seen several cases in FODMAP Freedom where I'm looking over their intake paperwork and their questionnaires, and they say that they're on a high fat or keto diet, but then they also have signs and symptoms of blatant fat malabsorption or bile acid malabsorption. And I, I'm a little bit perplexed how this isn't getting caught more frequently. But what I will say here, first and foremost, is fat malabsorption oftentimes will accompany symptoms like diarrhea or loose stools, pale stools. So instead of being like a nice chocolate brown color, it's going to be more like a khaki color or somewhere between milk chocolate and khaki. You might also see that your stools are very floaty or very fatty or even foamy, and they float on the top of the water. Now, as a side note, if you have normal stools or constipated stools and they float, I actually don't think that's a big deal. But what I'm talking about is diarrhea or loose stools that also happen to float on top of the water. That's what I'm talking about here. Uh, but I've had patients describe them as greasy or shiny or fatty, and oftentimes they are pale when there is fat malabsorption occurring. With bile acid malabsorption, where there's either too much bile or not enough reabsorption at the latter part of the small intestine, because as a side note, that's what you do with bile, right? So here, let me get rid of this. So the gallbladder or the liver, one or the other, is going to secrete bile into the small intestine. It goes down all the way through the small intestine, and then you reabsorb that bile, dump it into circulation, and bring it back up to the liver so that you don't have to make it again. So bile acid malabsorption occurs when you are not recycling it efficiently enough, or perhaps when there is an excess of bile due to a high fat diet, and more bile is escaping into the colon where it's causing dysbiosis and unwanted symptoms. Now, again, similar to fat malabsorption, with bile acid malabsorption, there's often going to be diarrhea or loose stools, and oftentimes they're going to be accompanied by a greenish or yellowish tinge. And that's because of the excess bile acids that are coming out in the stool. So if you have any of these symptoms, or if you have been tested for steatocrit, or pancreatic uh, elastase, and those are out of whack on laboratory testing, you really might want to think a high fat diet because that is a sign that you're not adequately processing that, that food. So that's the first thing to consider. So here, I guess I should make myself a list. Okay, so number one concern is either fat, malabsorption, or bile, acid malabsorption, sometimes called BAM, sometimes called BAM D, because like I said, it usually results in diarrhea. So that's number one thing to be concerned about when it comes to an excessive high fat diet. Number two is that this has been known for quite a while. Um, 
This is kind of like keto's dirty little secret that high fat diets, particularly diets that are high in saturated fat, yes, including coconut oil, promote leaky gut and something called endotoxemia. So what happens here, and let me write this down. All right, so leaky gut is when stuff is gonna cross this barrier and get into circulation or under the mucosal surface to the immune system more than you want it to. So these could be food antigens, they could be microbial antigens or microbes themselves, but leaky gut is when that barrier is opened up and it's breached and then critters and food and particles can get into the tissue underlying the gut lining. Uh, there are videos on this channel and on the IBS Freedom podcast channel talking all about leaky gut if you want more of a deep dive. Endotoxemia is like the next step after leaky gut if it gets bad enough, where you actually have a lot of these bacterial toxins called endotoxin or LPS that make it out across the gut barrier and into your bloodstream. And again, this is something that is widely known in research that high fat diets, particularly diets high in saturated fat, promote endotoxemia and leaky gut. And it's to a point where in research studies, if they want to induce leaky gut, oftentimes they will feed the mice or the humans a high fat diet or like a McDonald's Egg McMuffin or a McDonald's burger. So this is a pretty widely known thing. Number three, and, and I guess I'll put, hold on, and, Uh, not sure if that's an E or an I, but we're just going to leave it there. All right. Point number three, high fat diets have been shown to decrease beneficial bacteria like bifidobacteria. And a lot of the bad guys in the gut, like proteobacteria, seem to be just fine in a high fat environment. So another way that you could phrase this perhaps is that you start to favor the growth of microbes that are happy to digest fat or are bile tolerant, and you start to decrease the quantity of bacteria that are not bile tolerant or not fat tolerant, or there's a potential other angle here. So hold on, so let's see, so low, lower in bifida, which we know is a good guy, and potentially higher in proteobacteria. Now, here's the thing, right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it the dysbiosis causing the leaky gut? Is it the inflammation from the leaky gut maybe feeding into dysbiosis? What came first? I don't know. I'm going to wager a bet that it's the microbial composition causing the leaky gut, at least to some degree. But the question that I have, and I don't think I've seen any studies that really examine this, is is it the high fat content that is doing this to the microbiome? Or are we displacing other foods from the diet and we are inherently on a lower fiber diet, and it's actually the lower fiber intake that is shriveling down your bifido and promoting the growth of proteobacteria. I don't know. So theoretically, if you were doing a version of keto or a high fat diet that also was high or at least adequate in fiber, and you had a good variety of plant foods and nutrients in your diet, I don't know in truth if we would see the same microbial shift. But what I will tell you, because now you're thinking, oh, my diet's great, I'm special, I'm good. I would encourage you to track your nutrition with an app like Chronometer and get a handle on whether or not you're really eating enough fiber. Because I find a lot of people believe vehemently that they are eating enough fiber, and then when we actually get to tracking, they find out that they are not. So have the come to Jesus moment with yourself, actually try to quantify your fiber intake and see if you are matching that. And again, I, this could be a really big factor for those of you who have dysbiosis and leaky gut, and it could be that you are able to maintain a high fat diet still, as long as you increase your fiber intake to offset these deleterious effects. So now the question becomes, what now? Has Dr. Deneza become a big mean meanie yet again, and I'm taking away your high fat diet? No, not necessarily. I really do think that if you match the high fat intake with adequate dietary fiber, you could probably minimize or negate the deleterious effects that it's going to have on the microbiome and on the leaky gut thing. And if you happen to be a person who is blessed with great bile flow, great bile recirculating, and good pancreatic juice secretion, you might be able to digest the fat 
like a champion and the first two don't really matter to you either. So I think there is a world where some people are able to do this without too much negative repercussions on the gut. But that being said, I want to share kind of my angle and my philosophy and where I'm coming from as I give you this advice. Because I think, honestly, this doesn't get said in the internet enough. All of us have some degree of bias. All of us have some sort of like opinion or angle. And I don't think that gets talked about enough. So my nutritional philosophy is one of diversity and joy. And I don't know how to phrase this, but like longevity in the research. And what I mean by that last one is we all understand that fad diets come and go, right? We all are capable of looking back at the 1980s low fat campaign and laughing or judging and waving a finger at those people and saying, oh, I can't believe they were so stupid. <laughs> but what I don't find is that a lot of people are not capable of having the same kind of perspective when it comes to current nutritional trends. So yeah, it's one thing to look back 30, 40 years in the past and laugh at the people eating low fat cookies and thinking that they're healthier because of it. But does that mean that we should be drowning ourselves in coconut oil? Does that mean we should be putting butter in our coffee and like bacon on everything? Personally, I'm of the opinion that no, that does not make sense. Do I think that fat is bad or evil? No, not at all. But do I think that fat is like the blessed nutrient that we can overconsume without any negative repercussion whatsoever? Also, no. I would rather land somewhere more moderate and more sensible. So I'm a really big fan of balanced meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I also see the intermittent fasting thing as a big old trendy diet fad that's going to fade in a couple of years. I am not a fan of keto. I'm not a fan of carnivore for regular people, I should say. If you have a child with, with seizures or something medically necessary for keto, sure. Or even if you wanted to do it for a short period of time to help with insulin resistance and prediabetes kind of stuff, sure. But is this a long-term forever diet for all human beings? And is it the be-all end-all of nutritional science? I am of the opinion that it is not. So Again, I, I have shared some ways in this video that I think that you could maybe get away with a higher fat diet. Again, by increasing your fiber intake and making sure that you are actually digesting the fat that you are consuming more adequately. But what I would hope for most of you is that we can come back to some place of balance and we can get back to the basic like nutrition for human beings kind of stuff. Because here's the thing, right? These trends come and go. We have the low fat campaign and then paleo, the rise and fall of paleo, and then the rise and fall of keto. And now we're in kind of the height of carnivore being popular. So these fad diets come and go. And there are always going to be people who are shouting it from the rooftop saying that their diet is the best diet ever. And I know I'm going to get comments on this video from the keto and the carnivore people saying that I'm out of my damn mind and I don't know what I'm talking about. But what actually seems to have some longevity and makes the most sense for human beings and fits across many different cultures and many different diets and many, many, many different research studies is balanced meals, protein, fat, and carbs and fiber at all of your meals. Don't overeat and try to eat healthy nutrient dense foods most of the time. But also life is short and weird and spectacular and horrible and uh, amazing all at the same time. And we just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So I'm also of the opinion that you should eat the treat, eat the cupcake, eat the whatever, and enjoy your treats too. And I think your vagus nerve will be happy if you did. But in the words of Michael Pollan, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I think that you're going to be okay. In a world full of fad diets and super strong opinions and influencers for every diet known to man, what I just shared with you might sound crazy loco. And that's okay. If it sounds nuts to you and you're just a diehard keto person and you're not going to change that, that is okay. I know that my messaging is not for everybody. But for those of you who it resonated with, if you're sitting there on the other side of the screen thinking, oh my gosh, yes, that makes sense. Finally, somebody's speaking my language, speaking to me. I would love to help you. I would love to help you dial in your nutrition and understand if the, your current diet is working for you, where are your nutritional holes? Are there any vitamins or minerals or macronutrients that you need to focus on more? 
How is that affecting your gut, your motility, your microbiome, your digestive capacity? And ultimately, I want to help you feel great. I am really freaking good at helping people who have been told that they have IBS, SIBO, constipation, diarrhea, mixed bowel patterns, bloating, indigestion, and people who are finding themselves stuck on the low FODMAP diet or other SIBO diet or IBS diet. So if any of that sounds like you, and if my message resonated on any level, I would love to help you inside FODMAP Freedom when we are enrolling again come August. So I'm gonna leave the link down below. Go ahead and join the wait list and that way you'll be the first to know when we're enrolling again. And I will look forward to helping you with nutrition, the microbiome and everything in between come August. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.